Well, good morning, Horizon Church. Would you come and join us today in worship? Come on. Yeah. Let's praise. Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything.
in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Oh, that was a lot. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> All right. I wanted to read to you this morning out of Psalm 46. And it says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies 
is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. And I wanted to read that over you this morning, church, just to remind you that in times of great trouble, of uncertainty, of financial stress, whatever it is you're walking through, our God is a fortress. And because of that, I can say, it is well with my soul. Because my God is a fortress and he commands the armies of heaven. So would you take courage in that this morning with me as we sing?
Open up my eyes to see what you see. Open up my eyes to see what you see, to know what you know, to see your people. Open up my eyes, open up my eyes. Would you sing out this morning, church? Oh, I pledge my life to you, Jesus. I will build upon your love. I will build upon your love. It's unshaking. It's unfeeling. It will remain. Till your faith will stand yeah, yeah. I will build 
Good morning, church. My name's Jacob. Uh, if, you, if, you have, if I haven't met you before, I, I love this song. This is one of those songs that had a real impact on my life as a teenager. And I'm sure we can all think of those, of those songs. Maybe it's a hymn, maybe it's a, maybe it's a newer song. Those songs have impact with us and they just kind of bubble up sometimes. And I, I love that the band did this song this morning. It's a, they often have memories associated with us. And for me, it was, it was youth camp. We, I remember singing this song at, at camp one year and it just kind of, it stuck and it, it stuck and we took it back to our home church when we got, when we got home and it, it did something. There was power in it. And so this morning, we're gonna pray for our camps this summer that kids would have encounters with the living God. We're actually only just over three weeks away from our first camp starting here at Horizon. And so we're gonna press in and pray for our kids and our youth attending camps this summer that they might encounter God in a way that means they can sing songs like this and declare them for the rest of their lives that He would become their cornerstone, that He would become Christ alone in their lives. And so as the band just continues to pray, we're gonna press in. If you know kids by name at Horizon who are attending the camps, would you pray for them in this place? Would you start to lift them up as we pray together? Holy Spirit, would you come and meet with kids this summer? Would you come and fill this place? Come on, lift it up together. We pray for encounters with you. We pray for meetings with you that would change the direction of their lives, that would change the outcome of their lives. Lord, that you would work through them to work into families, to work into schools in September as they return. Lord, would you move? Thank you that you are Christ alone, cornerstone, that in you there is hope, that in you there is a way. Father, we pray for those songs that encounter kids for the rest of their lives. 
Jesus. In Christ alone. Come on, lift the voices one more time this morning. Lift your hands if you're willing and able to this morning. In the sea. singing, I felt like to encourage someone today, if you feel like the predominant emotion in your life right now is fear, the promise of not only a resurrected, but a conquering king named Jesus, is that he can be your stronghold, is that in your weakness, you can take it to a heavenly father who is more than able for you this morning, family, that you can find safety in a love that is unshakable. So if that's you this morning, I just want to pray that the lies, that the shadows that the enemy casts and brings to your soul, the battle that's going on in your mind, Whatever it may be, that like a flood, the love of our Father, the love of our Savior Jesus, our reigning King, might come and bring peace. So, Father, I come to you in the name of your conquering Son, Jesus. We ask that your love would overwhelm the things that might overwhelm us. That we would find tranquility and peace in the presence of King Jesus who desires to be with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we speak still to the storms. to the anxiety. As children, we come before the Father. We ask that you would speak to us because, Father, your words are the foundation to our lives. Your words are life to our soul. Jesus, we thank you that you are that and so much more this morning. Jesus name. I'm not sure who that was for this morning, but can I encourage you that King Jesus is close, that he is willing, and he is ready to step into your situations, family. So fathers, we continue in our worship this morning. We pray you'd speak to us. Let us have ears to hear, hearts that might understand. The Spirit of God would say through the living word today, in Jesus' name, amen. Can we give a hand clap of praise to Jesus today? Come on. We love you, Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. You can grab a seat this morning. We're going to continue in a time of offering, uh, but I got a really cool praise report that we're really excited about. Last week, Pastor Craig, if you were here, we had our mission celebration Sunday and our AGM, and it was just so much fun. It was like three weeks of Legacy Sunday into like 25 minutes. It was fast, furious. It was such a great reminder of just everything that God is doing through your generosity, through your obedience and giving of your time, of your talents, and your treasure. And Pastor Craig mentioned really briefly last week something called Pearls of Hope. It's something that, uh, friend church of ours in Denver started with those uh, going through cancer treatment and it's a way just to show real practical love and spiritual support through a backpack full of incredible things and in the previous year we've given out 50 backpacks we sent all over the country uh, Monday so 50 in, a, in 365 days about 50 backpacks we gave away Monday after the live stream, someone saw it, posted on a, a Facebook page that's for people going through cancer. Monday, we had 48 requests. 
uh, for backpacks across country. And so someone online, we're still trying to figure out who shared. If it's you, please let us know. We'd love to celebrate that. Uh, but we've kind of contacted them. And so we have, I think, seven backpacks left. So we're buying and repacking. We have zero now. Um, but if that's something that maybe you want to give towards today, because we got, it's about $2,000 uh, to do at least those backpacks plus more. Uh, and we're going to do it. And just believing that, hey, if this is something that the Lord's breathing upon, we want to do that. So if that's something you'd love to give today, you can just write Pearls of Hope. POH if you want on the tithe envelope that'll be in the basket so you can do that at the back um, we're just really excited to see what God's doing through that um, but we're gonna our offering scripture today kind of leads into Father's Day quite well it's Matthew 7 11. if you then who are evil before you get offended I'll say if you Daniel who are evil because I'm a sinner just like all of you I know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Friends, as we give out of part of our worship, part of our obedience, not out of obligation, but out of joy, part of our worship, part of that is we give to a Father who is just waiting to hear what His kids want just waiting for us to ask. And it's not that because we give, he's like, okay, since you gave, now I'll give. That's just his character. But I want to bring that into the context of our offering this morning. And before we give, I'd love to close our eyes, just out of the privacy of your own heart. Just let the Father know what you want this morning. Let us stir an expectation as we give. I know this morning I was encouraged to pray for my little brother who doesn't know Jesus yet. I said, Father, would you do something in his life? What are the desires, big or small? 20 seconds. Just let the Father know what you need. bless us as we give. Pray that jobs would improve, that promotions would be given, that business ideas would be seen, that salvation would break forth, Lord, that people would receive acts of kindness like pearls of hope or orphans, whatever it is, Lord, all the things. And we thank you that as we give, you move. And we're just really grateful that we get to be a part of that with you. In Jesus' name. You're on the end of the row on the right, you can grab the basket, and pass it. Our ushers will collect it on the other side. And we got a fun little Father's Day video before we jump into the message today. So you can draw your attention towards the screen. Hey, dads, it's really good to see you. I know you may not hear this a lot, but we want you to know how important it is that you're here. You don't have an easy job. Being a dad comes with incredible challenges, and sometimes it's hard to know if you're doing it right. But you should know that being here right now is such an important part. In the Bible, God gave us this command. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and might. These words should be in your heart. You should teach them to your children. You should talk of them when you're sitting at home and when you're out in public. You should speak of them from the time you wake up in the morning until the time you fall asleep at night. So what does it mean to be a good father? It means loving God with all of your heart, soul, and might, and teaching your children to do the same. And it's such a great example that you're here today, 
seeking more of Jesus and worshiping him unashamed. The kids here see you. The young men and women are watching, and as they continue to grow, they'll remember and do the same. So thanks, dads. Thank you for your presence and example. We pray that God will bless you, renew your spirit, and draw you closer to him so you can continue to be a shining influence to all those around you. Happy Father's Day. Good morning. How's everyone today? If you live in Surrey, did anybody get woken up or were you still up around quarter after 12 by a big boom? Yeah, I, I was like, Jesus is coming. The trumpet is sounding. <laughs> like, woke me up. Oh, I thought it was an earthquake, but it wasn't. So anyway, happy Father's Day. Uh, I always start, very often anyway, Father's Day with some good dad jokes. Someone told me, I think preachers just use dad jokes and they're just as bad. But So I've got a combo happening here. Like a termite walks into a bar and asks, is the bartender here? Some of you did. Why can't you trust Adams? They make up everything. Uh, why wouldn't the young crab share his toys? He was feeling shellfish. Okay, there's a couple more here. A slice of apple pie costs two fifty in Jamaica and three dollars in the Bahamas. Those are the pirates of the Caribbean. For the, how do you find Will Smith in the snow? This is so obvious. You just need to look for fresh prints. Uh huh. Come on, come on, come on. These are, these are really good. I'm like loving it. I could do this all day. Some of you are like, then I'm leaving now. Okay, just let me see this one. Uh, I got to open one more here. It's, it's good enough. Okay, here we go. A snail goes to buy a car. The salesman is surprised when the snail picks out a fast, expensive sports car. He's even more surprised when the snail requires, as a condition of the sale, that a big S be written on or painted on both sides of the car. Why would you do such a thing? Asked the salesman. The snail replied, I want people to say, look at that S car go. <laughs> That's a good one. Some of you need to just like write that down. Like you're going to use that tomorrow. Final one. What kind of pants do ghosts wear? Boo jeans. But if those, are dirt, if those are dirty, they just wear a paranormal pants. Oh, gosh. Paranormal? <laughs> oh, they're terrible. They are terrible, but they're really good. I like it. All right, I better put them away. I've got something open there, which is full of dad jokes. It's just like, put it in my pocket. Yes, it's a unique brand of humor that not everybody appreciates. And if you had to endure that and you hate them, I'm sorry. Actually, I'm not at all. But anyway, Father's Day can be kind of complicated uh, sometimes. We want to honor and bless fathers. but we all, And to do that, we also need to acknowledge the different realities that all of us have experienced, either as children or as a father. Because uh, there's just a wide range of experience in the room. For some of you, perhaps your father abandoned you literally or emotionally or even abused you, which is terrible. Perhaps he terrified you with his anger and rage and, or maybe you as a dad worked too much or played too hard and spent little time with your kids and you're regretting how you were as a father. Or maybe for whatever reason, your father is just not around today. There's the fact though that some of you have lost your dad no matter what the age or the circumstances of his passing or the timing of it, it's never good. And the loss is felt and we grieve with you. And maybe one of the things you could do today is share some of the good memories of your father with somebody. And finally, I know that many of you have had great experiences with your dad. This is where all my kids would have said, amen. You, you feel the pressure. You feel or you felt loved and had an incredibly great relationship with your kids or with your father. And we celebrate that. 
And so dads, today we honor you. And as we honor our natural dad, we also honor stepdads who help step in and help parent children that, of another. Those men that foster children or adopt children that were fatherless. Those of you that choose to open your home to the friends, or the friends of your children who maybe their home is not is, is working as well as it could be or should be. Those men that never had children yet mentor young people and teach others. Those 20 something men that lead small groups in children and youth ministry that help to nurture children and teens and give them a picture. Uh, I was recently, uh, oh, I'm not gonna share that, I'm gonna leave that. Hmm. Personally, from the perspective of a father, it can be very challenging. One day, you're just a guy, and then one more day, and suddenly you're a dad. And there's no manual for it. And if there is online, most of them say stupid stuff. But there's this weight that kind of comes on you, this weight of responsibility, and you feel this deep-seated thing that you didn't feel the day before almost that says, I die for these little munchkins. They might color the wall. They might vomit on the carpet. They might crash my car into a curb, but we still love them, and we die for them. Yet culturally, online, Every TV show, every streaming service seems to portray dad, men generally and dads specifically as bumbling dummies who don't know anything and can't do anything. And I, I Googled the phrase, who needs men? And it drew 2,810 billion results. So despite, but despite what culture says, Whatever our experience has been, whether positive or negative, the scriptures call us to honor fathers and honor fatherhood. For some, that's father, honoring your father simply means, I thank God that he was part of giving me life. That's all you can do because there was no behavior that you could honor. For others, it's just easy to do. It's an overflow. It's not hard. But I want to say that today, scripturally, no matter what culture says, we honor our fathers among us and we honor fatherhood as a part of God's divine order for raising children and bringing them to all that they're called to be. They're part of the picture. They're not just sperm donors. They're not just people that are kind of useless like an appendix. They're there, but we don't really need them. You're important, you're valuable, you're needed. When I was growing up in a small town called, most of you will know it, in a cusp, one of the things that would happen often on either Friday night or Saturday night, it's about, the main street is about five or six blocks long. It has one flashing red light. And you would start up by the hut and you would get in, man, young guys would get in their car or their truck. And if they had a truck, it was usually lifted by about that much and had a roll bar on it with lights. Uh, for hunting at night. Um, <laughs> that's another story. But anyway, they would go up and down the street, back and forth in their vehicle. And one of my brothers had a black 1968 Chevy Nova with tires about this wide, with under the hood, though, it had a 396. Those of you who don't know what that is, it was big. A big motor, four barrel carb. 500 plus horsepower. It could peel rubber in first gear, second gear, third gear, and fourth gear. And, and my brother for a while had the speed record in Alberta, that so the cop told him, of 187 <laughs> kilometers an hour when he got pulled over. It was awesome. <laughs> but it had this massive engine under the hood that let it do. And around the same time, I'm very different from my brother, I had a 1989, Suzuki Swift. <laughs> and it was anything but Swift. If your car has to be called Swift, it's not Swift. Chevy Nova, Suzuki Swift. Me. 
It had a 1.3 liter, 78 horsepower engine. It sounded like a Singer sewing machine when it would take off. I somehow got tickets on it downhill with, a, with the wind blowing behind me on the Coca-Cola, just letting her fly. I hope I get a ticket. I can get a ticket too. And what was really fun was when a certain young lady who later became my wife, the first time she rode in, so this is a cute little car. <laughs> my brother has a black Chevy Nova and I've got a little white me. Yeah, did I mention it got great gas mileage? But the point is that under the hood was the horsepower necessary to do what each of those cars was destined to do. Because no matter what, my little Chevy Swift was not Swift. But under it, the hood, was a little engine that got incredible gas mileage. When you're in Bible college and you have, don't have two cents to rub together, and people are asking you for rides, and you're like, I got to make this gas last, it was a good vehicle to have. But if I wanted to get somewhere quick, it was not going to fill the bill. But under the hood, it was designed to be economical and apparently cute. But both of these vehicles had the right horsepower to do what they were designed to do under the hood. Other rigs, my dad was a truck driver. He had semi-trucks that were low-geared and had incredible power to pull things, logs and all kinds of things that were, and loaders that would load up trees. This is telling you where I came from. And powerful, powerful engines that did different things that were meant to pull, that were meant to lift, some for speed, some for economy, all different kinds of vehicles that under the hood had the capacity to have an impact. But all the horsepower under that hood needed to be maximized and utilized in order to do what they were really called and designed to do. Now I want to talk today about the power under the hood of a godly father. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you're with us. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians, or Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12 says this. You are witnesses, and God also, how devout, devoutly, devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved among you who believe. I, as you know, how we exhorted, somebody say exhorted, and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul, who was a follower of Jesus, was not always a follower of Jesus. He, in fact, uh, hunted Christians down and would throw them in jail. It seems that he, some of them he persecuted, and others he might even have, have murdered. But he had an encounter with God that literally changed everything in his life. And here he was now, a planter of churches. And he had planted this church, and he had worked really hard to get the church started. He had served faithfully, and he was reminding the people of how, uh, what it really takes to get a church going and going strong. Because in that culture that Paul was preaching in and talking to, uh, it was a culture that was incredibly anti-faith, uh, anti-God. It was incredibly spiritual, but anti-Jesus. It was a culture that where slavery was, slavery was widely practiced. There was more slave than free people. It was a culture where, where children were sexually victimized and used for the pleasure of others. And in particular, the people of certain stratas and uh, economic uh, realms were not even recognized fully as people. Women were uh, used for the pleasure of men. Uh, and in, in it, there was animal sacrifices. People were sacrificed. It was an incredibly terrible time in history. It's a good time to remind us that in spite of all of that, that the church was able to still be strong and powerful, still be able to move forward, still be able to be a force for good in the world. And in 2023, it might be good to remind ourselves that the gospel is still powerful, that Jesus still moves, that God's still able to overcome in the middle of darkness and terrible things going on, that the church can still advance. 
This little sideline for some of you that are down a, down a conspiracy theory that everything's going to be terrible and bad and uh, the, the, the end is coming. But my Bible says that God is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So I'm going to continue to believe that the same God that 2,000 years ago that advanced could still advance today. That the same God that moved powerfully and healed and restored people can still do it today. That the same God that overcame uh, uh, cultural norms that had become entrenched that were evil and terrible could still overcome cultural norms today that are evil and terrible. The same God is still moving, that Jesus is still healing, that Jesus still delivers, that Jesus still sets people free. I don't know where that came from, but I think it came from the power of the Spirit of God moving. He still does it. He still does it in your family, in our city, in our nation, and in our time. That's for free. Okay. Okay. And in this passage, Paul then goes to outline the dad-like qualities that enable this church to thrive by God's grace. And as we go through them a little bit today, there's just three that we're going to look at. But we see that they can, they can cause families to thrive today because every dad is different. We have blue-collar dads and we have white-collar dads that haven't had dirt under their fingernails in 20 years. We have barbecue dads and we have dads who don't and shouldn't cook anything. We have dads who love sports and we have dads who don't have time for sports or any desire to know anything about it. We have dads who are quiet and we have dads who are loud. We have dads who are outdoorsy and we have dads who are not. We have dads from different cultural backgrounds and different nations and different experiences. And all of us come together around Jesus and say, can you help us? See, this passage shows men generally, father specifically, but really all of us, because it's referencing the character of God, the tremendous horsepower for men under the fatherhood. See what I did there? Some of you got that. Some of you are still wondering, is he awake yet? The tremendous horsepower under the fatherhood. See what I did, there it is. It's available to every father, not dependent on where you came from or where your background is or what your experience is or what you do like or don't like. And as we talk about these things today, they're available and reflect the heart of God for all of us. These three character qualities that we're gonna to touch on today. With three words, Paul was giving a picture of the horsepower under the fatherhood that dads bring to bear in a family. These words are exhort, encourage or comfort, and charged. Dads, your exhortation and comfort have come from this word para that means to come alongside. And so first, dads, I want you to know that your presence is powerful. Your presence is powerful. One of the things that I had to learn as a father was to be there, but to be there. Sometimes I would be there physically, but absent emotionally or mentally or reading something or doing something. But for all of us, this also is a reminder that we have a God who is with us. So his presence is with us as well. Dads, your presence is powerful. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not needed at the office or the golf course or the bush, or the side hustle. It just means that don't forget that you're needed by your kids. And I don't mean that to beat around the ears. I'm just trying to remind you of how powerful your impact is. It's needed in the moment because there's all kinds of things going on around us and your presence is a powerful, regulating, stabilizing force for your children and for your home. And if you're away and you have to travel, you can still keep in touch. You can FaceTime them. I know some dads who, that are away and have to work away, they're FaceTime them, right, their children regularly. You can text, you can maybe get on Be Real and, with your kids. If you don't know what that is, that's okay. If you do, I don't know why you do it. <laughs> but presence is powerful. There was this time when I volunteered uh, on a weekly basis at a youth custody center called Lakeview in, just outside of Campbell River. And I would go every week with a few other people and we'd do chapel and visit with kids and take them cookies. And 
If you just take cookies, you'll get kids, young people. They were all between the ages of 13 and 17, had done all kinds of things, most of them multiple times, because if you get into custody, you haven't been a good boy up to that point. But I asked this question one time in chapel. I said, how many of you, your dad is not in your home or abandon your home? And nearly every hand went up. In other words, the absence of father had a powerful negative impact. So flip the narrative and say, the presence of a father has an incredible, powerful, positive impact. And your presence is powerful and needed in a home and in the life of your kids. And I had to figure it out when, when my kids all along the stage, I think I just get one stage figured out and then all of a sudden it's something different. And then all of a sudden it's something else. And this one worked over here, what worked with that one, didn't work with this one and didn't work with that one, but they worked with that one. Like, it was all the things. But I learned one thing is that presence is powerful. According to a report in Fathers and Their Impact on Children's Well-Being, it says this, even from birth, children who have an involved father are more likely to be emotionally secure, be confident to explore their surroundings, and as they grow older, have better social connections and better educational outcomes. Now, let me just say something right here. If you if you're, have children that are in a single family or a blended family, or a single parent family or a blended family, get your kids in to church, particularly if you have a single parent family. Get your kids into church because then they can see a different perspective or see somebody that they might be able to model their life after. Or maybe they might get around a 20 something that's passionately following Jesus and see that there's, there's a different way than somebody else who's not present in their life. That that's the power of the spiritual church community. That's another reason why we don't live isolated, we live together. Psalm 68 and six says that God sets the solitary one into family and leads forth the prisoner with singing. There's power in the community of faith. So dads, the horsepower of your fatherhood is felt when you come alongside us, when you call us to your side. And often I would do this with my kids and they didn't always like it, but I would, when I was going to the hardware store, there was always a kid with me. And I did that deliberately because it gave me some one-on-one -on -one time. Sometimes they didn't say a lot, Sometimes we said a lot. They often hoped that we would stop at Dairy Queen or get some candy or something like that. And often I did because I just needed, knew that I needed to be close to them. That God had steward, given me these ones to steward them. So I would be the ones that would drive them to their friend's house. I'd pick them up from their friend's house. I would go late. I would get, arrive early, take them to volleyball game, do all the things, whatever I could do to be present with them. And I wasn't always as present as I needed to be. I remember one time I was in a, in a, at a retreat and just, uh, they had a, a pastor's retreat and I was reflecting and I looked back over the year and I was wondering, why did I feel distant from my wife and from my kids? And I realized that in the previous nine months with all kinds of different ministry commitments and leading teams and going overseas and going traveling locally and all kinds, in the previous nine months, I had been gone for three of those months totally gone. And I went, oh, maybe that's why, and not staying in, in touch. But my presence is powerful. The horsepower of fatherhood is most felt when we take the time to be present. And if you can't be present physically because of work demands, or you're working away, I know that's becoming more of a reality, or maybe uh, you're an immigrant and you're working here and your family is back in another nation, do whatever you can to stay connected with your kids because you are needed. You're not the appendix of your family. You're a needed and necessary part, and your presence is powerful. The exhort also carries the idea that it's a powerful thing when a dad calls his children to them to say, you can do it. Because not only is your presence powerful, dads, your voice is needed. It's needed. There are so many voices. TikTok theologians, people setting the, 
the moral temperature of your home. Your kids are in all kinds of different spaces that you're not even aware of sometimes. Setting agendas from the, the world around them, the peer group, all kinds of voices into their life. And there needs to be a voice that speaks, the voice of their father that brings encouragement, that brings comfort, that brings life, that sets the agenda, that helps them understand their identity, that, that, uh, that prays over them, that stands with them, that speaks life into their, into their spirit. Spirits. Because here's the, one of the meanings. In fact, one of that word that we translate exhort or encouragement was used of encouraging troops about to go into a battle. One of the historians has this word. He describes it this way, where there would be a Greek regiment that had lost its heart and lost its will to fight anymore. And so the general would send a leader to talk to that regiment to such purpose that courage was reborn and a body of dispirited men became fit again for heroic action. In other words, that's the picture that many of our young people need today. If you're a father, they need you to speak life into them. And you might say, I don't know how to do it. Just look them in the eye and say, I love you. Look them in the eye and say, I believe in you. Look them in the eye and say, you're gonna do great things in God. Look them in the eye and remind them that they're called by God and do whatever it takes to speak life because there's all kinds of voices around that are trying to shape them, to destroy them, to, to break their connection with God and with you. Fit again, your voice is needed. That's the horsepower of a fatherhood under the fatherhood that's a dad's voice brings. In a world with confusion, with anxiety, where we don't know what to do, the power of the voice of a father is incredible. Exhorting is one side of that coin, comforting or encouraging is the other side. It's from the same word, root word, it, it means to come alongside and it's a source of comfort in disappointment, in loss, in sadness, in trouble. The idea is to speak kindly or soothingly as to comfort or pacify. One of the things, you don't know how to comfort if you don't know where there's, what's going on in your kid's life. What's disappointing them right now? What's discouraging them right now? What's causing fear in them right now? Do you know? Maybe to comfort well, you have to know what's going on in them and around them. Jesus' voice is the same. He calls things that are not as though they were. Jesus is the one who says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. So sometimes when we don't get it from outside or we're not sure, maybe our experience with our father, we remind ourselves of what God said over us, that I love you, that I'm for you, that there's purpose in your life and for your life. Encouraging means to point the progress where a father might say, I see your growth. I've been watching you and you've come far. Or maybe it's things are so chaotic, all you can say is, I believe in you and I'm, I'm gonna love you no matter what. The idea is to speak kindly or soothingly so as to comfort. There was a time when, when our family was going through difficulty, all of us. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't change it. And most of all, and hardest of all, I couldn't make the hurt go away that my kids were experiencing. All I could do was hold them, cry with them, and remind them and comfort them that our Father loved us, our Heavenly Father, that he had good plans for us, now he was gonna cause whatever is going on in our life to work together for our good and his glory. The final horsepower under the hood of the father is to charge or to, it refers here to making an emphatic appeal, appeal to inspire, to implore, to urge, to charge, to call someone higher. They may be operating your kids at this level. Part of the duty of a father is to call them higher to the person that God created them to be. Your presence is powerful, your voice is needed, and your values are important. How you live is important. Because you can't call someone else to live high or higher if we're not willing to ourselves, right? This word means that dad has godly and biblical standards, values and beliefs that he lives by and that he leads his children to live by. It's not all comforts and cuddles and kisses, those are nice. Sometimes it's stern words and consequences, and that's the horsepower that's under the fatherhood, 
calling us to live by higher values and purpose. We can be consistent, we're not perfect. Dad's personal life and standard make a powerful impact when we call our kids higher. That we're the same person when we're in church as we are on Wednesday night, Saturday morning, whenever it is, that says so much. And it empowers you to call your kids higher when you, by God's grace, are trying to say, God, I'm not, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm better than I used to be by your grace. And you live that out the same way. The horsepower of a dad is felt when he lovingly and appropriately sets and enforces standards that calls children higher. Of course, not abusively in any way, but with a firm guidance, he raises standards and gives his children a valuable understanding of boundaries and appropriate behavior that will serve them for the rest of their lives. It looks different at age four, four than it does at 14 and then it does at 19. But dads, I want to thank you for the horsepower under the fatherhood that you bring to your families. All of us at varying levels that we'd like to do better, of course, like to be more present. Maybe you'd like to see your voice be used a little bit more powerfully for good and encouraging. Or maybe you're in a spot where you need to re you realize, I need God's help to live all the values that I'm declaring with my mouth. Whatever it is, I wanna encourage you that God is your source, that Jesus is the one who helps you, that Jesus is the one that helps every one of us to be who we're called to be. That in areas and spaces that we want to say, I'd like to do better in that, just ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. There's lots of good resources to help as well. To ask, ask a dad that you admire, maybe, to say, can you help me in this area? I'm not sure what to do. Be, and humble ourselves. But as I thought of this today, as we talked about the power of the fatherhood, under the fatherhood, I want to close with these three, three different spots to talk about. If you need to forgive your dad for the pain that was caused to you, today can be your day. You don't have to feel like it. it. Starts with a decision that God commands forgiveness for all of us. It's not about approving behavior. It's so that the pain and the behavior that was visited upon you doesn't destroy your heart. So that you can be a the man or the woman that God's called you to be fully, despite what might have happened to you, that your history doesn't have to be your destiny. And forgiveness is the thing that breaks that cord from our destiny, or our history defining our destiny. And don't be afraid to go talk to a counselor or a pastor to process the pain if needed. Secondly, Dad, if you need to ask for forgiveness, I had to... I had to do that so many times with my kids growing up. I am sorry for raising my voice. That is not the kind of man or father I want to be. That was wrong. And a four-year-old, it's okay, daddy. And a 15-year-old, okay, dad. With God's help, we'll try again. But if you need to ask for forgiveness, even if your kids are 30 years old, it's powerful. You can't control the outcome, but you can control the input. Finally, recognizing those realities, we also recognize the reality and the power of under the fatherhood lived out by dads. And so I just want to take a moment and say I honor our dads. We honor dads who get up early and work late to help their family to have food on the table and a roof over their heads. It's a challenge. We're so proud of dads who, despite being dead tired, still head out into the yard or the park with a ball and say, I'll play with you. So proud of dads who have tea parties and let their nails be painted while they put on a tiara. So proud of dads that just put their head down and keep going even when they're tired, discouraged, and lonely. So proud of dads who say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me when they fail in some way? We're proud of dads who model dependency upon God by praying with or for their children. 
We're proud of dads who picked up after dissolved marriages and resolved to continue to impact their children for good and for God. We're proud of men who are willing to be a mentor or a father figure to children who don't have a dad in their life. We're proud of men who have had a poor example of a father, yet still learn to lean on Jesus to be a better man and a better dad. We're proud of dads that are aware of and strive to balance the competing interests of work and family. And I could go on and I could go on and I could go on. Dads, you're not the appendix of the family. You are needed. Your presence is powerful. Your voice is needed. And your values are important. I stand to your feet. We're going to close. We pray in a for our dads, spiritual dads, mentor dads, dads in all kinds of different ways. And we're going to have a little fun. So, Father, if there's a, a dad beside you or you know a dad beside you or in front of you, just put your hand on his shoulder. If there's a mentor dad beside you, someone who's leading young people, mentoring or old people, whatever it is, just put your hand on and pray over them. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you. For fathers, we thank you for the fatherhood. First of all, we thank you that you are a good, good father, even as we heard in our, devo in our uh, offering talk today, that you're a good father who gives good gifts into his children. Thank you that you are good even when we're not, that you're faithful even when we're not, that you love us even when we don't love you, that while we were yet sinners, you sent Jesus to die for us. We're so grateful. We're so grateful. Thank you that because of Jesus, if we surrender his, our lives to him, he can begin to change us from the inside out, whether we're uh, a woman, a man, whether we're a father, a mother, whether we're single, married, whatever, that all of us, the potential of life transformation is possible when we surrender our lives to Jesus. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Lord, I pray for our fathers in the room. I pray that you would strengthen them, encourage them, that you'd help them to find their voice, that you'd help them to be present, that you would help them to live out the values that you've called them, that they speak out of their mouth, Lord, that each of us would be able to live them out in a powerful way. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you're with them. And I pray your great blessing over them, spirit, soul, and body, that this would be a year of transformation, of growth, of, of uh, uh, growth in your spirit, growth in their relationship with you, growth in their relationship with their, their children and spouse. In the strong name of Jesus, and everyone said amen and amen.